Welcome to um, today's training session. So um, the idea of today's session is just to give you a bit of a glimpse at um, some real life experience. Okay, so a lot of you are here because you've faced some SharePoint challenges already or you suspect you're about to. So you've made the decision to come to a conference and try and get um, a bit of a head start or, or learn how to, to fix some of your existing problems. Okay, so um, what we're going to do between, the, uh, between ourselves today is just talk through a process that we've been experiencing. Okay, so the process involves the challenges that a large company might face when they're um, moving over to SharePoint. Okay, so pretty typical scenario that a lot of you will have been through already. Um, what makes this situation interesting is that it's global. So it's a big old challenge, some of those things that go with that. And also there's over 10,000 users, so the scale of this thing. Um, we'll be talking a bit about the time scales. Um, a lot of what we'll be talking about is how we identified potential risks and uh, neutralized them. So it's not really a, a horror story, if, if anyone was hoping for a horror story of, of nightmares. Um, it's more about identifying those problems before they, before they come up. Um, it's not really a technical session. It's not a dev or an admin session. We're not going to talk about how to set up multiple servers and install them. It's more the soft things. It's a lot of the things that people don't always think about, although there will be some te technical aspects. Yeah, there's the simpler um, technical aspects. Okay. Um, the reason I'm part of this session is that I've actually been a SharePoint trainer in a lot of these rollouts, these global rollouts. So the past five years or so, I've been traveling around the world, just having some conversations about that, and working with all sorts of different customers. And uh, what we find is they face the same problems again and again. So, so that's why I'm here. I see the end users, the site owners, the site members with the genuine problems. They, they're worried about the speed. They're worried about how does it fit in um, compared to their, their email systems, their network drives. So that's, um, that's the part that I'll bring to this process. So that's me. Um, if anyone wants to chat about um, sort of general training or about the session at the end, uh, I'll be down at the Combined Knowledge Stand. Okay, so that's me. Um, also, we've got Ben with me today as well. Introduce yourself. Yeah, um, my name is Ben Thompson. I'm the digital communications manager at Johnson Matthey. So I've been um, kind of very much involved in this project within within our company. You want to be in control. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so I'm going to be talking a bit about MyJM, which is what we call our um, our SharePoint platform, and how we managed to get in the pilot phase about 1,200 of our scientists uh, collaborating, communicating, and networking through this new system. So a bit about Johnson Matthey. Um, Johnson Matthey's history goes uh, back almost 200 years, uh, but it was really in the 70s, in 1974, when we made the world's first catalytic converter for using, car, uh, for using cars to reduce uh, pollution from car exhaust fumes that really changed our company uh, and kind of brought us to where we are now. So we now, now one in three cars, one in three of every car is fitted with a Johnson Matthey catalytic converter. Uh, we're a FTSE 100 company. We employ 10,000 people in around 30 countries. But it's not just about cars. We're a very diverse company. Um, we're also behind the technology that keeps your strawberries fresher for longer. So if you buy a pack of strawberries from um, Marks and Spencers, uh, we're helping them cut food waste uh, by prolonging the life of those strawberries. So whether it's the clean air you breathe through uh, reduced pollution or the nice uh, fresh strawberries, Chances are you'll probably have benefited from Johnson Matthey technology without even, even uh, without even knowing who we are. So why would a company like Johnson Matthey need something like MyJM? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about the needs um, that we identified right at the very beginning of this project. I'm going to explain how we launched MyJM with the help of Dr. Jim. He's our superhero mascot, superhero in a lab coat. Um, I'm going to talk about the impact of MyJM. Uh, about five months since we launched, and also look at some of the lessons that we learned um, along the way. <coughs> so to start at the beginning, why did a company like Johnson Matthey need um, something like MyJM? Well, a couple of years ago, we carried out a big strategic review, and one of the um, issues identified was that as we'd grown as a company quite quickly over the last few years, um, there was a certain amount of um, kind of silos that had built up, so different parts of the organisation didn't necessarily speak to each other. And for a company like Johnson Matthey, whose success is built on innovation and our ability to develop new technologies, new products, we really needed to work better together. Um, we also found that at a practical level, um, people within the company were getting very frustrated with some of the IT systems we were using. So things that should have been very simple, like just finding a phone number, um, were impossible. We didn't have a global people directory. And some of these um, kind of IT barriers were really impacting on how people work together. 
So, um, for example, if a team in London were working on a project with a, a team in, in the US, they didn't even have um, simple things like a shared drive that they could all access. And if they did have systems where they needed to keep things very securely, there were so many passwords that they had to use that actually they just wouldn't even bother. So um, within the company, at quite a strategic level, um, it was identified that we needed to get better uh, at collaborating together. And on a practical level, at a grassroots level, there was a real um, kind of demand for better uh, collaboration tools. So I can jump in there, Ben. Um, mm. Some of the practical um, restrictions, if you imagine uh, a lot of these people are scientists, okay? so they do quite like technology, but they're, um, they may be like uh, instruments in a lab rather than computers. So it's a different aspect of technology. Um, imagine if there's some sort of a reactor that they've got to do some testing, and that's in America. And the guys over, it, over in the UK need some testing done on a certain type of uh, material or a chemical. So they would have these regular communications where I need some work doing over here, but the guys in a different country need to do that work for me. Yeah. So um, they're generating all this result data, all this information, and they were literally having to resort all the time constantly to, at the end of every test, email, attach, and ping it off to whoever they think might need it. Yeah. So these real specialists, this, this information, and it was really just all over the world. There was, there was no common ground other than the, the, the very busy email system. Yeah, absolutely. And because as a company we're very much science driven, science and technology, it was in, within that research and development community, those 1,200 scientists, where the need was greatest. So um, that's kind of where that was our starting point. Um, so we had the kind of strategic um, business case was made. We had a lot of appetite uh, within just regular users within the company. Um, and the most pressing reason for bringing this in was that our plans were and, and are to grow by about a third over the next five years. So all those problems that people face at the moment with 10,000 staff, um, we knew that when we had 15,000, that would become an even bigger problem. So um, we had a very clearly identified need, and the next thing to do was kind of work out how we could actually address that. So um, when we began to look at how we could um, address those problems, um, we went back to the users, and we did workshops with them, and we didn't want to kind of bring in a system that was imposed on people that came as a shock. So we did very much involve people in that, um, that beginning process. So the IT people who had kind of identified SharePoint, but we didn't want to just uh, do SharePoint out of the box. We knew, having spoken to our users, that we had to really kind of customise it and configure it um, around their needs. Okay. So ah, okay, yeah, this is back to the IT side of things. Okay, so we're, we're on the verge of SharePoint, um, but we've maybe looked at what's going on, and uh, we've realised that as a global company, you can't just install SharePoint, you can't just get the CD or download the MSI, and away you go. Um, so there was a bit more to do beforehand, um, so let's, let's just take a quick look. So um, there was no single directory, uh, there was no single active directory. Actually, we found, um, as part of this process, there was 27 directories. So depending on which part of the world you wanted to search, you would, you would need to look at the, one of these 27 directories. No one had full access to all of the directories. So if you're trying to find someone's, some basic details like who's someone's manager or what's someone's phone number, as a user, you just didn't really have a chance. You could probably find the details of people that worked at your site, the people that you already knew. But really what they wanted to do was, was kind of get over these boundaries. So these established boundaries of department, site, even country, we just wanted to, to get rid of all those boundaries. And that's really what SharePoint promised. But uh, to get there, there was a big migration process. So there was uh, people within the company and experts that were brought in to take 27 directories and make it one active directory. So that in itself took several months just to achieve that. Okay. So it doesn't sound very exciting, but before we could have SharePoint, that had to happen. Okay. So that was kind of step one. Um, the next thing we thought about, well, what do they use for email? And obviously, uh, I was coming into the company, I bet they use Outlook. No. They still use Groupwise. Who knew? So uh, does anyone else still use Groupwise? No, I think, <laughs> I think literally they were the last people using Groupwise. Um, pretty much. Um, so yeah, they've got 10,000 or more people using Groupwise. Um, so they thought, well, we could use Groupwise. I wonder how well Groupwise integrates with SharePoint. <coughs> Not really particularly well. They like the idea of synchronizing things offline to Outlook. Um, so we decided to move. Small decision, big big implications. So um, they went through and looked at what data have we got in this, these email systems. It turned out there's 32 terabytes. So there was a nine-month migration process. And again, this is all just in preparation for SharePoint. These little hurdles that they came across, which again, for us, oh great, we'll make the decision. We, we, we think we want Outlook. We're going to go to um, what would be Outlook 2010, as it turned out. 
And uh, behind the scenes, it meant some late nights and, and long weekends for a lot of the actual IT people that were doing the migrations. As always, the migration is not as smooth as, as you would expect, and some things end up being done by hand. Um, also, there was the idea that the email servers were all over the world. So there was like 60 email servers. Yeah. So they were all over the place. So depending, again, um, not by design, but remember the company grows through acquisitions. Yeah. So, uh, so there's, there's a lot of that, all different versions of all different things. So, uh, so yeah, easy to say that, but it took nine months to make that happen. Um, we thought, well, we've, we've got all these different versions of Office. Again, as a company, there was not a single, a single central IT department that pushed out software. There was all these different departments around the world, so we had to coordinate with them to get everyone up to Office 2010. How did we decide on Office 2010? Well, kind of going back a year ago or more when this started, SharePoint 2010 was the current technology, and we saw that Office 2010 is what matched. To get the full functionality, really, of what SharePoint says it can do, you have to have the right version of Office. Has anyone else been stung by that before? Yeah, and hopefully you hadn't already installed it before you realized and hadn't had to upgrade afterwards, but potentially it's kind of dangerous stuff. So to get the full benefits of this, this SharePoint software that we'd bought into, we needed uh, Office as well. So again, that's a massive global rollout. So we had people on pretty much every version of Office that's ever been. Um, some of it probably involved having to upgrade uh, people's local computers on their desks as well. So again, all of this was being driven by SharePoint. How many other people have seen this as well? SharePoint is what we want, and it's just driven everything else to be upgraded. So it's cool, right? We're going to get all of the tools, and we've not finished yet. We get more toys in a minute, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely an important part of the process. If anyone's not gone through that yet, if you're still early on, so if you've kind of not had the problems yet, Microsoft have a few documents to help you with that. So there's the classic Fair, Good, Better, Best, one of my favorite Microsoft downloads. So if you've not seen that, Fair, Good, Better, Best tells you how, uh, what was SharePoint 2010 worked with the last four versions of Microsoft Office. Yeah, and it didn't just say it kind of works, it works fully. It had screenshots. So it's a big old PDF that shows you exactly what should and, no, not what should, what will work and what won't work. It's definitive. It's very clear cut, that one. Okay, so that's good. We like those documents. Um, so that's Office. So we thought we'd have that as well. So this all was as part of a two year project. Yeah, so all these things are coming on. We're lining them up. Um, there's actually about 20 internal people working on these projects, and then there's, there's consultants coming in in these different areas to do with email and SharePoint. So they're all kind of coming in as well. Um, so that's all happening nicely. We were thinking about this, and we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could have, have some instant messaging as well? Yeah. We're going there. We're having Outlook. We're having all the other Microsoft technology. So instant messaging was more or less the only thing we were missing so far. So we thought, yeah, why not? Let's have Link as well. Um, we already at that point had a central directory, we had Outlook, so we were pretty much on board with Link as well. Um, I think that's probably one of the best decisions that was ever made, having Link. Um, we'll, we'll see the end result of all of this, we are going to get to the SharePoint bit eventually, but uh, the idea that I can find someone by uh, a skill they have, someone I've never met before that's in a different part of the world, I can see they're online and I can send them a question now and get a response straight away. So that whole process of me realising a question and getting an answer from an expert within the company that I'd never heard of who's in another part of the world, if that whole thing can happen in like two minutes, that is so powerful. Um, we know that they needed this because when we were doing some little training sessions to begin with, when people were coming together from different parts of the business and we were sat in the canteen having some food, excellent canteens as well, by the way, <laughs> congratulate you on that, um, what we found was people were asking each other questions and they were like, oh, have you ever done this type of testing? Have you ever worked with diesel to do this rather than uranium? And they would sit there and just within half an hour they would have sort of shared some knowledge and shared documents. So we know that we needed something online to, to facilitate that. All these different experts had a lot to say. They were all very interesting people. Imagine hundreds or thousands of scientists. Um, so um, scary and good all at the same time. So Link, another great decision. So we'll see some of the benefits of that. Um, other parts of the infrastructure had to be upgraded as well. I'm the wrong person to really talk about this, but um, there was over 110 pieces of hardware that were purchased to make the network run more quickly for compression and caching. Um, because as a global network, we, um, because of the way SharePoint worked, um, we had to consider what if someone's connecting in from Japan or America, but the servers are over here in the UK perhaps. So we had to make sure, and a lot of testing went into that to make sure that they would get hopefully the same good experience or a pretty similar experience to what we would get sat just up the road from where the servers are. <coughs> is it a coincidence that's really kind of near where you work, isn't it? So you get a really good experience and they get <laughs> kind of a, an almost as good an experience. Okay, so, um, so a lot of uh, effort went into that as well, upgrading a lot of connections and a lot of physical hardware, so not to be underestimated. 
And then uh, not least of which then from our big list of things to do was this develop MyJM. So another, another consultancy firm, another Microsoft partner was brought in to actually customize MyJM. Um, so again, they did pretty well at the, at the start to avoid the word SharePoint. Yeah, I hate SharePoint. People get, get away from that word. So from the early stages, we, we, we describe this thing as MyJM. Ben will talk about that a bit more in a moment. But um, that development process, again, involved um, kind of best practices. So actually looking at uh, testing, user adoption, a pilot. So um, we are actually through all of that now. We're actually pretty much at the end of the pilot. We're yep, that's right. Yeah, and then we're, we're into go live as well. So um, we've had a lot of the, the kind of exciting bits when the first person logged in and the thousandth person, person yeah. logged on. And we're, we're just getting into the big, the, the big part of the global rollout. Okay. So the very last point on here, um, uh, we already covered that, but the idea that there was 20 people involved and consultants. And the whole process, including the development of the custom SharePoint, was two years. Uh, has anyone got any ideas how long their process took from start to finish? Has anyone took longer? Two years for you as well? Yeah, two years. 18 months, two years. So it seems like a practical time to get everything, every, get your house in order um, and, and make things happen. OK? OK, right, back over yep. to Ben. OK, brilliant. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I started off by talking about how um, this project began with the needs of, of the business and the needs of the users. And we followed that using user involvement uh, through many stages, and, and especially in terms of the actual design of, of the implementation of, of SharePoint. So um, as Rob mentioned, um, we've branded our system as, as MyJM. And I'll say a bit more about the branding in, in a moment. But we didn't use the word SharePoint once in any of our communications. And, um, one of the reasons is because we didn't want people to feel that we'd just taken something out of the box and imposed it on them. So what you're looking at here is, is the home page of MyJM. And the principles behind it are really that it's all designed around the user's needs. So um, I was speaking earlier about um, some of the kind of practical um, problems that people face. So um, at a kind of really basic level, it's got a people directory. This is the first time that the company had had a people directory. Um, the last time it had a people directory was when it was... Um, when there were um, enough people that you can manage to print it, but with 10,000 people, um, that's, that can't be done. Um, in terms of the other side of uh, uh, the people directory, um, being able to find uh, people in the company who are the right people to speak to was a massive challenge. So you might have known the name of the person, in which case you can just type that in. But um, what MyJM also does is enables you to find people based on their skills or uh, interests as well. Yeah, I, I think probably out of everything, when we're doing the training sessions with people that are actually going to be the end users, the scientists and the, the people in the labs, this is probably the thing that they get most excited about. Um, the obvious thing of just being able to find someone's phone number, just a very practical thing, but the idea that they can turn it around and not search for someone they know already, but they can search based on the skill, a, a project, a qualification. They're actually... Uh, can be so fussy now with this because there's so many people in the system. They cannot just search for someone that knows about creating Excel macros. They actually can go in and say, I'm looking for someone that knows about Excel macros that's based in the same site as me and also enjoys football. That's how fussy they can now be. Now that people have populated their profiles, they're not just realizing a kind of a person that will do, I'll try phoning them, but hopefully they'll have an idea. They can really identify them. Um, they really like the idea that they can put in these ask me abouts. We describe that as having an open door. So you've got skills, which is okay, maybe someone might um, come and ask me to work on a project. And then you've got ask me about, which is kind of like for them saying, I'm happy to receive instant messages and emails about these, these things. Yeah. So again, people kind of either open their door or not by, by using this ask me about. That was one way that we, we, we used that to make a distinction. Yeah. Um, so MyJM makes it easier for our employees to find things that they, they're looking for um, specifically, either by name or by kind of skills and experience but it also brings things to their attention that they uh, may never have known about. So one of the ways it does that is in the colleague suggestions. So when you, this is, everyone's homepage has the same kind of elements, but obviously personalised to them. Um, so uh, these are some of my uh, people who are uh, being suggested for me to add to my network. So this guy has got something about digital in his, in his profile, so that's being uh, suggested there. Um, the middle column is once you've added people to your, uh, your network, you get updates from what they do. So that's a little bit similar to some of the, the Yammer functionality that we saw in the, in the previous uh, session for those of you who are there. And the third column is where anybody in the, in the company can post a blog and it gets seen by everyone else. 
So um, if you think back to some of those issues that we face where parts of the organisation didn't know what other parts of the organisation were doing, this is a way of kind of bringing things to the surface, um, creating a bit of kind of serendipity as well, you know, a bit of randomness uh, to help people make connections. Yeah, actually, one of the things that was good with those blog posts is the way we talked about that in the training session is uh, there was a few steps to becoming famous <laughs> yeah, within the company, so a lot of people really liked that. So step one was to fill in their profile, so that they've got some of their details in there, their skills, their projects. Step two was actually to uh, consider blogging. Yeah, so they've put in that they've got these skills. They're doing interesting stuff all the time. Again, a lot of these guys are research scientists. They're literally testing things that, that have never been tested before. They've got access to some fantastic tools and materials, these materials that cost ridiculous amounts of money, and they're doing these clever things. So they do interesting stuff. They have stuff to blog about. So we encourage them to blog about it. And actually, we we're really surprised by the response we got. We had a couple of like testing one, two, threes coming through. But gen generally, uh, there's some really nice things coming up. One of the cool things was a uh, graph of the week or chart of the week. So imagine how exciting that was for scientists. This, <laughs> These guys that were doing all this analysis, and uh, one, one guy in particular was uh, creating yep. these charts of the week. So as he sort of dug through stuff he'd done that week, he'd do a screenshot, do a, a bit of a write-up, and he, he was becoming more and more well-known within, yeah. within that, um, that group of people and within the company as a, as a whole. So yeah. particularly people outside of his department were commenting on that blog, saying, yeah, that was a really interesting idea. What, what machinery did you use? How long did it take? And these conversations between people that just didn't know each other at all before were all starting to happen. So that was kind of one of the most exciting times for us. We knew that's what we wanted it to do, but we're actually starting to see already that happening. So yeah. it's, it's actually real now. Yeah, they love, actually, they love graphs so much. They even, some guy posted a graph about the optimum time to get to the canteen when, when most people <laughs> left but before more people got there. So um, They do analyse stuff a lot. So those, those colleague suggestions on the homepage and the activity feed, they're all driven by... Um, driven by the profile page um, and all of these things that we kind of switched on from the beginning and the way we designed that home page that all came out of the kind of work, workshop sessions that we had um, from our users and also going back to those needs at the beginning so it was all designed to be um, uh, my jm was, was customized really to make the most of sharepoint to encourage that collaboration and that networking side um, the other thing that um, people really wanted was a place that they could put their files and share those safely and securely um, with whoever they wanted to share them with um, at any of our locations around the world. So if you think back to the problems they had with shared files and, and not being able to get to things, um, part of um, my JM, as well as the networking side and community side, is the kind of project management side and document management mm. side. I think... Um the way that we approach this from the, uh, from the development point of view is you, you know if you've been creating sites previously in the past, there's all these different types of sites you can create, and a lot of them are pretty similar. I think Microsoft have even realized that now in 2013. We've got less types of sites available, if anyone's noticed that. So we sort of thought, well, okay, well, if Microsoft are doing that, maybe we should be doing that. And actually, we got it down just to three types of site that people could create. Yeah, so three different types. So, so uh, probably the smallest site we decided was a document repository. It literally was one library in a site. So that's a document repository. The idea of that was people have got all this stuff in their network drives, or even worse, on their desktop or on their C drive. They, they even confess to it. They, they know some of them so little about computing that, yeah, I save it all on my C drive. And these are desktops. These are not laptops sometimes. So that could be kind of scary. So uh, actually, for them to be able to take this stuff that they might have generated over years and years and just have a place where they can put it into these repositories, instantly it becomes indexed and is searchable. So we were having content that had been available to one person before, and just by them spending literally maybe four or five minutes uploading some of these things, th that same set of documents was now available to over 10,000 people. Yeah, and that's a big change. That is a massive change, and obviously that's a really powerful thing to be able to do that, but that way of working is, is completely new to our company. Um, and scientists are used to, well, our scientists certainly, they're kind of used to working on things. They don't always like to share their results until they've got to the end of a project. But by the time you've got to the end of a project, someone else might have been working on that same thing. And if they did know about it, they could have saved months and you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds. Yeah, there was, a, there was actually a really good example of that um, in one of the training courses just before Christmas. So um, we get all these newbies in, they've never seen my JM. Um, before, so we get them to log on, fill in their profiles. And one of the first things we do is like have a search, have a look around, see if there's any documents in there that you find interesting. Because it's a live system, there's all this stuff in there already. 
whole load of it was uh, brought in from a few different network drives around the world, stuff that they would never ever have seen before. So there was one guy that was about to start a brand new project. You know, some, it's a different kind of idea. His boss had just sort of set him this task that he was about to start later on that week. And what he did is he started to search around the names of the, the materials involved and the different types of testing he was going to do. And what he found was in 1981, within the company, someone had done that test. He literally found that same document that normally would never have found. It would have been tucked away in some private little archive somewhere. So it was kind of crazy, but um, this stuff was there, and it came up that so that really was a good proof yeah. that this search was working so well. Yeah. yeah. So, so those very benefits to the company and to individuals, they're the things that people are also very scared about. So it's the kind of a double-edged double yeah. thing. We, we tried to introduce it as well as a, uh, at the same time as introducing the system, we were looking to bring around partly a cultural change, wasn't it? So rather than each department being self-sufficient and actually being quite proud of it, we were looking to say, well, if there's something that we're spending this money on as a company for some research, by default, you should be sharing all of the documents that go with that. Yeah. So imagine if um, this one actually was a uh, project site. So imagine if we've got this project site. So we've had a, a repository, which was a small one that you just drag stuff in. This one's a project site, I think. So the project site, the idea is um, you request one of these things. Um, so there is a basic approval process to make sure that we've not got sites being created willy-nilly. So it goes through a simple approval process, fairly quick, and you get yourself a project site. At that point, you're the owner of it, so you can customise it, colour it in, whatever you need to do. Um, you then press a button to say, I wish to share this with the whole company. So they just, uh, there's a custom bit in the security where they can just go in and say, I want to share this with the whole company. And that's what we're saying to these, these new site owners, project managers, whoever they turn out to be. When you're working on a project, if it's funded by the, uh, by the company, and it's not private to a specific customer, you need to press this button and it's going to let you share it with the whole company. Part of how we sold that to them was, if someone keeps requesting stuff from you, you can just point them there. So a lot of that sending out weekly emails to all these different people, which meant that as the person doing the work, I'm also the person that has to post it to everyone every day or every week, which was happening all the time because these people were waiting for the results. Um, we could say to them, no, just kind of create this, let people know that it's now centrally stored and invite them in. Don't let them modify it necessarily, but let, let them come in and grab that. So that's kind of how we sold that to them. So they went from being scared of, sharing that work and someone else being able to do something with it to the idea of, oh, great. So that kind of frees me up to get on with my work. And obviously, they like that. Yeah. Um, the final type of site, just to mention it, uh, was just a team site. So it was a document repos uh, repository, a tiny little one, uh, a project site for projects and sharing globally. A team site actually was pretty similar to a project site. I think the main thing with the team site is there's no specific goal. A team site was something that was going to be ongoing, so like a departmental site, effectively. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think one of the reasons that we put so much effort into actually working with the end users was because we realised that this was a massive change to the organisation. Um, and we couldn't just bring something out of the box and launch it because it would have just fallen, fallen flat. Um, so before we even got to the launch, um, we'd identified that need um, both at the higher level and the kind of um, user level. We'd work with them on the solution. But the next, next thing to do was to kind of do a bit of preparation work before we actually launched it. Um, so what we realised was that um, in the kind of line management level, those were the people that could really be a massive help to this or a complete blockage. Um, so having kind of built the thing, um, we then kind of took it on a bit of a road show. So we went to management meetings at our um, kind of main R&D locations and kind of showed them the work in progress, um, explained to them how the security worked because we knew that was a big issue for them. And then what they told us in those meetings, we then built into our communication messaging. Um, so even before the launch, we kind of did that pre, uh, kind of warming people up bit. Um, super users, which is quite a kind of common thing when you're launching um, something like SharePoint, um, we made sure that we found a super user in each uh, team. In fact, we asked the managers to nominate or find volunteers. So that would be someone who could uh, champion MyJM when it went live, give, give their colleagues a bit of support. And at the leadership level, um, we spent some kind of one-to-one -one time with people like the chief executive to get them set up with their profiles um, so they would set that really positive example. Um, so by doing those things, we kind of avoided some of the problems that might have occurred um, if we'd launched it. Um, we kind of, kind of warmed people up so there was kind of, they were more excited about it and could understand it before we, um, before we launched it. So that was all the kind of uh, preparation work, really working with the users. Um, then came the fun bit, which was the launch. 
and that's where, um, that's where Dr. Jim comes in. Um, so here he is, flying in to save the day. Um, so one of the phrases that I'd heard banded about before we launched my JM within Johnson Matthew was this thing about initiative fatigue. Um, lots of new things had been brought into the, the company um, and maybe hadn't always gone as well as they could have done. So we wanted to make sure that we gave MyJM a very strong uh, identity. So we did develop um, uh, some branding for MyJM so that it would be recognised wherever you went in the company. Um, we got a whole load of mugs made that we, we sent out um, to create a bit of a buzz. We actually kind of rolled it out site by site. So all the users for MyJM, just before their training was about to start, um, a big delivery of mugs came along with, with some sweets as well, which went down really well. Um, and the idea behind Dr. Jim himself was really to send a message that this was a new way of working within the company, and culturally it was a different um, way of working as well. Um, there was a feeling within Johnson Matthew that although as a business we were very high tech, absolutely kind of groundbreaking um, inventions, but in some ways we were quite old fashioned and quite formal. So Dr. Jim was a way to kind of say, actually, you know, it's okay, you can have a bit of fun with this. Um, of course, he's kind of tailored for us, he's wearing. That's actually um, pretty much what they wear in the labs without the cape, kind of a white, white lab coat. Um, and in terms of the international thing, we tried to kind of design him in a way that would um, give him kind of global appeal as well. So we kind of factored that in. I think um, one of the sort of things we saw as a side effect to that with all these mugs going round and these sweets that say uh, my jam on, and then we've got one of the banners over there as well. Mm. Um, actually, when I arrive to do the training, normally I say I'm here to do the SharePoint training, and they go, what? What's that? Whereas I say, I'm here to do the My Gem training. I go, oh, yeah, My Gem, yeah, we've been expecting you for two weeks. And, and actually, that wasn't just like at reception. They're kind of all the people there, although they hadn't tried it yet because we wouldn't let them onto it because we didn't trust them yet. <laughs> and we learned a lesson there. Um, they all knew what it was. They all had a, an idea of it. And as you said, despite the fact there was all these other systems coming and going, they were all kind of curious about it. So, uh, some of them were sceptical. They're paid to analyze things. So some of the hardest training days I've ever done. You know, imagine everything you say, you've got like 15 scientists pulling it apart. Yeah. And again, a lot of them really proud that they don't use Facebook and they, they stay off Twitter and all these things. So, um, yeah, interesting days. But the main thing was it definitely worked. They were, they were switched on and they were, they were curious to see what it was all about. Yeah. So, so if, the, if the branding was kind of part of the style in which we kind of launched it, we also wanted to back that up with some substance. So... In, in all the messaging that we kind of did for MyJM, we made sure that we explained the, kind of the vision for the system, really. So we didn't start by saying it's SharePoint and you, know, you can add a file and you can do that. We really started by kind of saying, kind of imagine what could happen if, if you could connect with your colleagues, if we could harness all the amazing talent within, within our company and in this first phase, first phase within the research and development community. So we kind of tried to get across that big picture at the beginning. Um, and as well as the, uh, what what the benefits were to the company, we also emphasised what was in it for the user as well. So I think, Rob, you mentioned earlier about um, making yourself famous within the company. In terms of the profile, you know, we said to people, look, you've got all this expertise, you fill in your profile, people will know about that. And if everybody fills in their profile, um, you'll be able to find people who can help you do your job uh, more easily. So you can save a lot of time and effort that way. Um, we also, as you can maybe see on the banner there with the different languages, um, this, is, this screen here is actually part of a presentation that we sent out to everyone, but we did get it translated into about 10 different languages to kind of help, um, help with that. I can't remember, that, that was about a month before the system was going live. You were kind mm. of, we were still a few weeks away, no one actually had access at all, but already we've got these headlines <coughs> of you'll be able to find people, you'll be able to share information. And these, are, these actually were things that <coughs> kind of two years before we'd identified people wanted to do. <laughs> So, yeah. they're, so they'd been um, wanting these things, and uh, again, they were very keen to find out how it was going to work. Yeah, absolutely. So having grabbed people's attention, the next thing to do was to kind of keep the momentum going. So on MyJM itself, we ran various campaigns, things like Blog of the Week, um, with the kind of map of the world there, we showed where um, people were being trained, so we kind of gave a sense of progression that mm. the rollout was going on, and it was very important for us to get that message across that this was a global um, global platform as well. Um, we have, in, I'm part of the communications team rather than the, the IT team, and we have a monthly editorial meeting where we kind of look at um, what's coming up, and we realised that Valentine's Day would be a good thing to, to use MyJM for, so we did this idea of um, using your, your status update to describe the thing that you most love in all the world. 
So someone here is talking about the volunteering they do uh, with scouts. Um, someone else that they uh, like going for a run at lunchtime. Um, there was actually a prize you could win for this, which is uh, we've got some special chocolates made. My JM uh, blog of the week, this one says. So I think the third person here who's saying, I love Dr. Jim's cape, I want one. I think he was more, more trying to butter us up to get the prize, really. Um, but actually, this chap here won. Um, he said that he was, he was loving the peace and quiet before his first baby was born. So we ended up giving that to him. Um, but if these, if these things do seem maybe a bit gimmicky, a bit silly, actually, they're all about supporting that collaboration, that sharing, that networking part of MyJM. And we could actually see uh, live on the system that people were adding colleagues as a result of things like Blog of the Week. So I could see that someone in the UK was adding um, Lee or someone maybe in Germany was adding other people. Um, so these things had a real impact. Um, so MyJM, the homepage itself, was a really good way to communicate about MyJM to the users. But the other thing we did was actually get out there in person and within our research and development community, they have a big um, scientific conference uh, once a year where they all get together to share their latest um, findings and that kind of thing. So we went there with, with MyJM. We kind of took the banner, we took the marks, set up a stand. Um, and it was really a chance to, to show people that MyJM wasn't going away. It wasn't just something you had on your computer. It was actually part of everyday life. And we had our, uh, our director of research and development at the conference. He kind of introduced MyJM in his kind of opening remarks. Um, the chief executive of the company, he kind of finished the conference and he talked about MyJM. And um, it had, as you can see from the photos, it had a really good response. This chap here is kind of volunteering as, to say that he looks like uh, Dr. Jim. So that's kind of, it's a bit like kind of Spartacus. Everyone's claiming to be Dr. Jim within, the, within Johnson Matthey. So this, these were, I guess, the launch activities about you know, using the branding to kind of get people to wake up. This is a new thing. Um, you know, backing that up with the explanation about why we're doing this. I mean, like Rob said, um, you know, our pilot group were about 1,200 scientists. These people are, you could say, if you're being negative, you could say they're cynical. If you're being positive, you could say they're sceptical. They do kind of question things for a living. So we really had to back it up with that substance. And then the nurturing the community, kind of doing all that follow-up follow -up work, um, was really necessary, um, especially as it was such a different way of working, and um, we knew we had to put the effort in. So that all began in terms of the launch. We launched right at the end of November, so we're, we're a few months on now, um, and uh, kind of really towards the end of the pilot, as Rob said. So in terms of the impact of, of MyJM, um, before we launched MyJM, the company already had a kind of corporate-wide intranet that was only being used on average um, by about 3% of uh, users um, uh, kind of every day. So within a few months, MyJM is already being used by, uh, on a daily average, 25% of users. So that's a, a big increase there. And on, on the days when we kind of send out things like um, our MyJM newsletter, that kind of goes up even further. Um, I think just to add some context to that as well, um, one of the things that, that actually... Um, controls how many people go into the system is if their whole department's moved into it yet. So as part of the rollout, we, we've been uh, training different individuals, and as, as you, anyone that's tried to put a training schedule together will know, you can't just take a whole department and out for a day or two days and train them. So um, the sort of thing that was happening is maybe um, in November we'd train five people from a department, and then it might be December that we get to train the rest of the department. So until the whole department can actually get into the system and has an idea of what's going on, they, they couldn't adopt it yet. So um, yeah, we've got a bit more on that in the lessons learned, but actually we're, we're just getting to the point now where we do have whole departments, whole, whole regions on the system, and, um, and that's, we're starting to see the figures go up a lot now. Uh, also, it wasn't uh, mandatory. We didn't say to people, you can't use the network drives anymore. We could have forced people into it, but we know they would have been resistant. So um, especially like we said, because they were quite sceptical. They had seen a fair few other systems come and go, these systems that didn't last, you know, they've been promised the world before and it never, it never kind of arrived. So again, we were quite careful with this. We kind of approached it in a way where we offered them all these tools. And we literally said in the training, if you want to, you could just open this up, you could search the address book, find the person you want, and then close it back down again and carry on working. Yeah. But actually we found, as, again, as soon as they started to see, well, hey, have these network, uh, these libraries have got versioning and approval and, and check in and check out all this stuff they started to then gradually move towards it. So they're, <laughs> uh, so they're just 
sort of tentatively moving there rather than um, flocking. <laughs> so it's all going the right way and it's not flattened out yet by any means. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you saw earlier that on the home page of my we have, we have the blogs column. Um, we weren't really sure how that would take off at the beginning, but actually since we launched we've had 900 blogs um, written on the system. Um, and people are using that as a way to ask questions. They're, in a way they're using it a bit like um, some of the features that we saw, for those of you in the previous session with Yammer, they're kind of putting things out there to the whole company. And we're seeing a lot of discussions on there. And a lot of um, uh, kind of anecdotal success about MyJM has come from that blog section. Someone writing, I need a new supply for this, or someone wrote a blog about, um, about glass and another person posted a question saying, how can I kind of fix glass to glass? And then the guy posted some very clever explanation of how to do that. So um, having those blogs on the homepage has, has been really fantastic for us. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the whole combination of the, the different ways that people can get in touch with each other, again, we've seen it working. We can, we can follow the paths of it happening. So there was a good example uh, just a few weeks ago where we're doing a training course. We'll have a look what's going on, what's new, what, what's, what's changed. We'll see some posts coming through. So someone might have read an article on the internet, and as a, as a result of that, they'd written a post and included a link to that article. Um, one of their colleagues liked that post, which then told 10 of their colleagues about it. One of those colleagues came back and then replied and added more to the original post. So we, we can see these, these combinations. And again, a lot of what was happening there wasn't between just the same, same five friends that sit, sit next to each other in the same department. This was, again, global, just kind of really naturally happening. I, um, it's, a real, it's a nice soft channel of information that was coming through to, to people. Um, it was quite a difficult decision when the blogs were being put together, actually, because we were thinking, well, should everyone be allowed to blog? Um, there's always the worry, what if people say what they're thinking? <laughs> what if they just post it, whatever they think? Um, I think we took the, the, the thought, the process there, that pe it would be policed by themselves. You know, if, if people are going to realise that anything they put up will have their name next to it, probably their photograph, where they're based, who their manager is. So uh, in the most part, if people are going to mess around on computer systems, SharePoint uh, is not the one to mess around in. It kind of traces back to you pretty directly. Um, so we went down the route of everyone can blog. And we didn't even put limits on exactly what they should blog about. Yeah? So there's, uh, there's charity things in there, but, but equally there's, there's some people that are, um, their, their whole department is, is to help other departments. They provide services within the company. So they were doing these fantastic case studies of what they'd been doing. And again, they've got some fantastic responses coming back. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier about the, the effort we put into kind of influence the influencers. So this is our, our chief executive who, before we launched the system, I spent a kind of a session with him making sure, um, getting his profile up to date. Well, I say that. I kind of showed him how to do it a little bit, but he did it all himself. Um, and um, this is a really good example of how MyJM has brought in a completely new way of working or a completely new uh, way of thinking for the company. So previously, um, our employees would maybe hear from the chief executive once or twice a year in maybe like a 1,000-word letter that probably somebody in my department wrote, and then that was emailed as a PDF out. Um, now he blogs himself, you know, a few hundred words, probably at least once a month, you know, when he feels like it, but also we kind of maybe suggest he might want to blog about such and such, um, and gets loads of comments as well. So his blog is actually, um, it's not just a vanity project. We look at the stats. His blog is the most popular blog out of all, all, the, all the other people's blogs um, uh, on, uh, on MyJM. And it gives, um, gives staff a chance to kind of ask him questions, have a bit of debate, um, and it also, um, this is an example of him kind of modelling the behaviour that we want everyone to engage in. We want everyone to um, collaborate and build on each other's ideas, to ask questions, to, um, yeah, to, to communicate together. So um, the blogs has been a fantastic channel for him to kind of act as a, as a really positive role model for, for that change that we want to see within the company. Um, and going back to that, um, that vision that we talked about at the beginning, um, uh, connecting all of our 10,000 employees around the world, um, over the last um, five months since MyJM has been in its kind of pilot stage, those 1,200 scientists, through adding people uh, to their colleague connections, adding people to the network, have actually generated 70,000 connections. So um, you know, those are just a few figures of where MyJM has really kind of proven itself already in just a, in just a few months. And those connections were made um, 
either by them directly looking for someone and adding them or through the colleague suggestions web part that we have on the home page. So quite often a, a lot of them are coming through that colleague suggestion. So these are people that just have something in common with you. So again, it could be as um, you, you both like football, but also it could be you have the same job title. So a lot of them were coming through that, that process. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the kind of biggest result, I guess, or the biggest kind of good news in terms of that pilot is that um, a few months down the line, um, our chief executives committee met um, last month and actually decided, yes, the pilot's been, been a success and we now have to roll it out to all 10,000 people. So um, they're, re they're really pleased with the results and kind of looking to us to deliver more. Um, but in terms of some of the uh, lessons that we learned along the way, um, Rob kind of mentioned this earlier, um, we were probably, probably a little bit cautious to begin with and we knew that... Um, with SharePoint, things like the project side and the, and the team sites um, is actually maybe quite difficult to use if you've never seen that before. So we were a bit worried about letting people loose. And also the security side of things, um, we wanted to make sure people were trained before they started putting documents on there. So we didn't actually switch people on to access it until they'd been trained. Yeah, so that literally meant on the day of the training, so when they were about to log in, we'd add them to a security group. So the night before, they couldn't look at my JM didn't exist to them. Um, one of the other things that that meant was some of their department had had the training two or three weeks before and were all kind of excited about it, hopefully, or at least feel like they could, could start to use it now. Um, they were going through adding people as colleagues, and actually, if anyone's played with that stuff before, that automatically sends an email to these other people in the department, which says, great, I've added you as a colleague. Come and look at my profile. And when they tried to click that before their training, it would say, beep, you're not allowed in. It was a custom message that sort of kindly told them that, because you've not had the training yet, you're not allowed in. But it actually was a, was a real barrier. So probably if, if there was one thing that we might have done differently, um, we probably would have, do we think, switched on those people? Yeah. I mean, the good thing is that we realised quite soon that that was a problem, so we kind of sorted it out. But it, it meant that it was a bit of a sluggish start to begin with. Um, and you know, one big part of this is that we're a global company. We want people in 30 countries to connect with each other. And if, if one country is not going to be switched on for three months after the other countries, then it's going to be a bit of a problem. Um, the next thing there is about um, kind of letting go of um, control, really, I suppose. Um, so the project team, we knew that MyJM was a, a new way of working for all the users, but I guess it was also a bit of a new mindset for people like IT and HR as well. So when we launched the system on, on people's profile pages, there were certain fields that were editable, some weren't. There was a lot of debate about things like job title. You know, can you let people put their own job title in? And the, you know, the, the kind of traditional IT response and maybe HR response too, certainly within our company, was the quite traditional reaction to begin with, which was no, because someone might write something silly. Um, so uh, to, when we launched the thing, that was the case. They were, that was uh, not edit editable. Um, but, you know, the details weren't all correct on the system, even though best efforts had been made. So um, users were going on, actually getting quite annoyed that their job titles weren't correct, expected, naturally, to be able to change it themselves, but they couldn't. So that was another change we kind of brought in fairly early on, um, but it would be nicer to have got that right to begin with. I think what fixed that pretty quickly was about 300 calls to the local IT support desk saying, can you change my job title? Yeah. <laughs> so they, they that wore pretty thin within about two days. Yeah. And then within a few days more, we changed it so they could edit it themselves. Yeah, so I think it's a new way of working, but not just for the users and that you know, the project team is kind of separate from that, also a new way of working for the project team as well. Um, with the training, um, I think maybe we didn't realise um, that some parts of the organisation had been using SharePoint for a while. Well, we kind of knew about it, but we didn't necessarily factor that in with the training. So um, some people were going along with the training, fantastic, it was all new to them, they were really happy with it. Other people, maybe it wasn't quite the right level for them, because we actually made the training mandatory. Everyone had to attend a day's training, and then super users would have a second day. Um, so I think really if we'd made that a bit more optional and thought about who really needed the advanced training, that might have worked a bit better. Yeah, there's, in a smaller company, there's things you can do, I guess. If you've got maybe 100 people to train, you might actually sit with them and do their training needs analysis. And if they're clued up, they can say, yeah, I already know about this. I just need to do a bit of an advanced course. They could perhaps tell you what they want. But when you're, when you're working with 1,000 people or 10,000 people, it's not, not really likely that you can do training needs analysis for everyone. And also, if you did do that, do they know what they really need to know? Yeah. They might have some thoughts on it, but often they don't know what they don't know. So uh, 
So yeah. I think I think the the idea of a core level of training to ensure that everyone could could switch to a previous version, could check in, could check out the sort of things you need to do to get the benefits of SharePoint. So we think everyone was kind of good to go through that. But um, but yeah, you're certainly right. Some people came in and they breezed through that class, and I just kind of said to them, just make the most of it. It's a nice easy day. Yeah. But uh, obviously they would have liked if we could have done some more advanced stuff for them because they'd some of them have been SharePoint users for like two or three years. Um, yeah. So I think partly that's some of the difficulties around that for us was being a company of 10,000 people and having those kind of people in those 30 countries. Um, once we kind of decided on the training program, it's a bit like a juggernaut that's in place really, and um, it was kind of a bit difficult to kind of change that once it once it was going on. Um, so one thing I would probably would recommend if anybody's doing this with a big company is, you know, we had our IT people, we had our comms people, and we worked very closely together. What we didn't really have was someone within our company overseeing the training, kind of coordinating that. So in terms of delivering the training, you know, Combined Knowledge did a really good job, got great feedback on that, but we didn't really have anyone within the project team who took responsibility for training. It was kind of, it was like, oh, we'll get, to Combined Knowledge can deliver that, um, but we probably... Uh, probably could have paid a bit more close attention to that, I think. Yeah, so, as, so as, uh, as part of the company, you would have had insight if there was someone in that role to sit and think, right, do the, does this department already have SharePoint? What have they got? And, and, and work with them so that then we could come in and do an appropriate level of training. Yeah. yeah so that they could have done a fact-finding mission, couldn't they, at that level? Yeah, um, and then the last point there, I think, is around, again, uh, in terms of using SharePoint, as if you've used SharePoint, I'm sure probably everyone has, there's loads of really clever things you can do with it. Um, a training course can give you a certain amount, but then our users then went back to their, um, their locations, um, you know, a week after the training, maybe they wanted to set up their project site. They didn't really have anyone they could call to get support on for that, because we weren't really set up. Um, the idea that the super users could do that support, we kind of misjudged that a bit because they were still learning as well. So really kind of having that follow-up support after the training and an ongoing um, support would be, would be something that I think for the next phase, we're trying to make sure that we have that in place. Yeah, I think so, um, the idea of the super users, so we'd identified super users and trained super users, but they were still new. So they'd had half a day of general training, one day of super user training. So um, for in our context, a super user was actually going to be creating the sites and controlling security, amongst, amongst other things. So yeah, they, they could press the buttons and they could work it, but when an end user came to them, they weren't a developer. They couldn't quickly generate a series of sites in the best way possible. <laughs> So obviously the super users, there's at least one of, one of them amongst us, um, busy, busy, um, basically were able to um, come back to us and ask further questions as part of the training. Yeah, so we, we were luckily still around at that point and the super users were able to come in and make the most of that. But obviously you can imagine there's, that role's kind of difficult, isn't it, as a, as a, even as a knowledgeable site owner, um, rather than being a brand new site owner with lots of requests coming in. So yeah, definitely giving those people as much support as possible. Having followed that a few months further down the line now, so having had the initial, right, we've not got enough knowledge to get going, um, what we've seen is that there has been, um, through some of your encouragement, a community now of these site owners has, has, has um, arisen. So um, within that, there are these more experienced SharePoint people that have actually started to do miniature versions of the training courses that we were doing. So they're taking some of it, they've customised it to be even more bespoke, and then they're rolling out that within their sites, within their departments. So again, some of the most popular blog posts have been about kind of this sort of second or third level of, of MyJM training that's happening within the company at company meetings and conferences. So um, that was sort of some of the most, most downloaded files, I think, were these, these little presentations that have been put together. Yeah. So we are seeing that community is more established now. It's yeah. always going to be difficult because until you've got your environment, you can't start training the super users. So when the timescales are kind of short, you're always going to be pushing it a bit. Yeah. But, uh, but they're getting there now. It was just an initial. Sorry, was that?